Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at DareResponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. So we have quite a few questions today, but Michelle, I think we are going to let Patrick speak first, or what is your plan? <clears throat> yeah, so we thought it would be cool to start bringing in guest speakers, maybe down the line, some experts in other fields like nutrition or exercise, meditation, things like that. Um, other members who have been through the program. Um, so we thought we'd start with Patrick. Um, and hi to everybody who's joining in all the little, let me pull up this chat here so I can see everybody. If you want to say hi on the chat too, you guys are welcome to pop on. Um, if you want to ask questions through the chat as we talk, that's great. We also have four single space pages of questions that I will talk as we will talk as quickly as possible and answer. Wow. But for the beginning, um, we wanted to bring in Patrick. And if you wanted to share your experience with Dare, introduce yourself, say hi, maybe for the first few minutes. And then and then I know you probably have to go off to work and then we can um, just do the rest of the questions. Okay. So should I just start, Michelle? Yeah, sure. So like, tell us about like, you've been through dare and you know like what were your experiences with dare what have you found helpful what do you find like the key i know you said there was one thing you really wanted to focus on when you were yeah. joined in today yeah absolutely so first of all thanks for allowing me to come on i'm really uh very thankful and excited about having the opportunity to do it so um you just just very quickly I've recovered from pan panic and anxiety altogether. So there's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, I had a disorder for roughly 25 to 28 years. Um, so it was very paralyzing for me. Um, it was a very dark place, um, very hopeless, um, and not knowing where to go and where to turn to, and losing quite a bit of any real vibrancy to continue on. So that's how severe mine was. And I don't want to talk a lot about that. So along my journey, though, there are certain things that I became very aware of through D.A.R.E. that I try to hold close to my heart and really concentrate on as best I can. And I call these aha moments. A long time ago, I used to say they're aha moments. And one of the things that really became important to me that I felt was needed, that I needed to to, to be cognizant of his confidence, um, you know, an unbelievable antidote mm -hmm. to really getting to a place that opens up this freedom uh, to really just have your life back. And so if confidence was the antidote and that was uh, crucial in my journey to recovery, you know, how do I intentionally plan and determine what needs to be done to gain that confidence. And the always the thing that I love most about Barry's book is the simplicity of it. And, and this is not rocket scientists, uh, but I need it simple. Um, mm -hmm. I really did. And so how does one create confidence? How does one build confidence? And the one thing I became very aware of was to practice pretty simple, right? But I, I had a hard time practicing early on. I didn't want to feel those feelings. I didn't want to be overwhelmed. I didn't want to get caught in the anxiety loop. Um, that kept me stuck for a long time until such time that I knew that if I didn't do something different, I was going to keep getting what I got. Mm -hmm. And so practice became my intentional focus, no matter how painful the experience was going to be. Oh, the only way I was going to try to be able to gain some confidence. Now, was I confident as hell when I first started doing it? Hell no, that sucked. I hated it. I wondered why I would never get better. Why is this happening to me? Why do I have these setbacks? Why do I, why, 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 why? And what I began to understand was, Patrick, you're connecting practice with being successful. And that means you're oh, getting- that's good. I like that. I'm going to steal that from you. Practice is not successful, right? Practice is practice. Practice is practice. Yeah, absolutely. And so what are you expecting, man? I mean, 25 years of 
28 years of the, this ingrained response. So why don't you try to start looking at practice as my confidence will begin to build as I learn to accept discomfort more mm -hmm. and let go of equating. I'm only getting better if I feel no anxiety. This is like the golden nugget of dare yeah. here. Yeah. And so when I stopped being so majorly disappointed when I wasn't successful and as uh, instead accepted my discomfort around the practice of the tool, there's mm -hmm. a difference between white knuckling and practicing. I was really good at white knuckling, mm -hmm. okay? But I had to have some different method to gain the kind of confidence I was looking for and when I, when I approach my practice in that manner, stopping this expectation of success and learning how to be comfortable with discomfort and the thought that I just did it, that I just did it and how wonderful was that, I began to, to gain some sense of confidence, okay? And as I did more of that, what had to occur to me is Patrick, you're getting comfortable with some simple things like just going outside for a walk around the block and things of that nature. So how do you build more confidence? How do you get to the next level? Well, you any up or you go after the most next scary thing and you begin to tackle that and, and you do it on a regular basis. So, even though, again, it's going to be uncomfortable and you have all these things about you that you have to try to, to, to work the tools through to, to, to go to the next state or to the hotel room or to the beach or to dinner with someone or to wherever, that confidence comes by doing it. Mm -hmm. But Patrick, I'm, I, I must ask something because I'm sure this question pops up in the head of many people and it's a question Michelle and I get asked all the time but it's so hard so what kept you motivating to keep doing the hard things day in and day out if it wasn't for the success that gave you the motivation and you can pre-answer some of these questions now that you're asking that because that's actually so patrick you can stay on and answer this first question for us then because it is building resiliency motivation to move forward right so yeah. This can be your question for the day. How's this? Yes. Speak about sustaining growth periods. What would be some things we can do to ensure we remain out of the mental garbage pail? I know you have a good term for that. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, I'm a chronic pain sufferer, li limiting my mobility, which limits my exercise, causes weight gain, which in turn causes more pain. I know which exercise I am able to do, but have no motivation, again, motivation, as I constantly live in the world of I can't instead of I'll try, which is really getting me down. Please, can you help? And then here's another similar one. Um, yeah, like some days are easier than others, basically. And sometimes I get so worked up over something so little and other days I can like accept things that are even more difficult. Um, is this common and, and what should I do to keep going? So that's kind of, since you're going to talk about that, I thought we would say these, if anybody has is listening who asked these questions, if you want to pop on the chat and say you're here, then we'll uh, talk directly to you. But I'm sure there's other people, anybody else in the chat find that's a similar thing. Like I get it in my head, right? And now it's like implementing DARE. Everybody wants to read DARE and memorize DARE and then suddenly just be like floating through the clouds. And it's like, the practice part is implementing dare so that all kind of ties in so can you go right ahead patrick that i think those tie-ins are probably what you were going to say so i thought yeah. that was the question yeah so so two things on that one is um i don't know maybe i was in such a painful place that being where i was at um was only gonna keep me stuck and keep me in a very unhappy place. And so the alternative to not take the risk, the alternative to not feel that intense pain, the alternative of the potential of growth um, kept me motivated to continue on. Um, and that's the reality of it. It's it's really it's really it's really a, a insidious 
type thing. And what I mean by that is, isn't it, isn't it kind of really sad that the, the one thing that I'm afraid to do, the one thing that I'm, I'm avoiding pain from to get to the other side is so insidious that it's keeping me stuck in my own pain that I can't think past, I have to go through pain. And this is the key factor for me, the hope I had, the trust I had. And, and I will tell you this, that for me, see, I want to be around people who I want to talk to people and I want to learn from people. And I want to do what, what people who have gotten to the other side do. Um, because they've been there and they know it. That gave me, a, like when I saw other members growing and getting confidence and moving on against people who I know exactly how I felt, that gave me such tremendous hope when I was not hopeful. Mm -hmm. When the pain was too much when I went out, I would come back and say, but John and Jane and George shared last week, they're moving. I, I, I had to shift from comparing to being grateful that I was being exposed to people who were getting to the other side. Comparing kept me stuck. Yep. That's the insidiousness of this, this disorder. The comparing kept me stuck. How about this? I'm never going to get it. I'm always going to fail at this. I'm never going to feel comfortable. I'm never going to do this self-fulfilling prophecy. You, you have to be courageous enough. And so this hope and this progress and doing what I just had this thought of who's ever getting to the other side of this, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And you know, you did things for the sake of doing it. Right. And that is like such a key. That's hard to get. If you're doing something with the goal of a feel. Yep. Good luck. I know that's the overall goal. And everybody's like, well, what the hell we just signed up for if I'm not going to feel better, but it happens by accident. It can't be a direct goal. And I think once people get it, this makes more sense. And it's hard to, right. It's hard to explain this to somebody who doesn't, is not there yet. So it's like feeling better is a byproduct of dare. Dare is not a direct path to feel better. So the practice Yep. Like you grow confidence doesn't mean you eliminate, you're not directly eliminating fear and then I'll feel more confident when I'm, we're not looking for fearlessness, right? We're looking for confidence. That means trust in my body to feel fear. It took me five, sense. it took me five years, Michelle. Because you're a tough cookie. You're smart. And that's the problem. We got smart, tough fighters that get stuck. I mean, if five years before I started seeing some there was progress occurring the whole time, but, but really seeing a difference and holding on to those things that am I really getting better? Is it, is it really changing? And, and yet these moments of seeing differences, but I mean, everybody's journey is different, but, but I went through five years of not having a lot of fun practicing per se. Right. But I also knew that with that practice because of others stories, this is going to turn eventually. And I do see progress. Right. And, I and that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean everybody's going to have to practice for five years. It means no. sometimes like you, you probably realize once I really started practicing like the right way, it kind of falls into place. Right. Probably like the well, beginning even, practicing I wasn't judge, practicing. I don't even judge that, Michelle. I don't even judge that. What I say is whatever it takes is whatever it takes. Good. If it's five years, two years, two days, 10 years, whatever the case may be, it's not, it, for me, I, I had to stop measuring mm -hmm. where my progress is to others. And I had to stop measuring why I'm not getting, because that's, that was setting myself up to fail a lot of times because my expectation was when it's all gone, yep. that, 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 and I was in a wrong space. So who, I, there's 38 participants who thought, who maybe still thinks that when it's all gone, if I could just get rid of this, right? I just needed to be gone. And once it's gone, I'll be fine. So anybody in the chat, just say like, yep, yep, me, 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 or no, because that's really the key to really understanding how to use DARE. Yeah. 
And it's so natural, right? Because this is what we do in life. This is what we used to do. Let's fix this problem. There's a problem. I put it at the center of my universe. I fix it. And then I go back to life. But the problem is when we do that, we make anxiety relevant. We make it big. And the goal is to make anxiety irrelevant, unimportant, something that accompanies you, but it's not worth um, putting your attention onto but by doing that by putting our lives on hold and saying okay let's fix this let's fix this we do exactly the opposite and we get more of that right right this was my picture from yesterday if anybody saw it like we stop life to fight the problem so if there is a bear stop life and fight a bear we don't care about the fight right the fight is for the bear but what happens is when we treat thoughts sensations feelings the same way we're treating just I, you know, exactly what you said, except with the worst drawing version of it. <laughs> like we're stopping life to treat thoughts. I get rid of these thoughts. If I get rid of these feelings, if I can get rid of just I control these physical sensations. So like if the problem goes from this to this, this is the problem. This is what we're talking about all day. Not, oh, but all these thoughts. I have two pages, two full pages of just this kind of stuff. So um, we'll go through that in a couple minutes, but it's, and I think if I read them out loud, you'll, it'll be easy for everybody on this chat to see like, oh, it's not feels like this, but it's a thought. It's a sensation. It's a feeling. And when the goal is a feeling, you will continue to keep fighting feelings. We think until they're gone, but with anxieties until you've dropped the fight of, and, no. and the other side of it too, Michelle, which was a big aha moment for me was, and I love when the word was introduced to me. And you really intentionally have to be in this space when you when you when you do it. So, a really just awesome thing for me was when when the word "be the hunter," be the friggin' hunter, Patrick. Okay, so you're going out. You're going. You're going to California for two days, and you have all this anticipatory anxiety, all the triggers. But I'm hunting today, man. I am hunting. As soon as I get in my car to go to the airport. I, I don't want to be a victim to this. I don't want to be a cautious observer of, is it going to come? Mm -hmm. And if it does, mm -hmm. oh my Lord, I need to tap back into being the friggin' hunter. And I'm going to stay the hunter the whole time I'm out there. And if I'm the hunter, I have this thing about me that brings this element of strength as opposed to this being a victim and waiting and cautiously observing about how it's going and, and see I'm not ready or see it's, it's too much just yet. That's all getting me back into that stuck area. Mm -hmm. And so I have to consciously do that. And I mean that, I mean, I would just like sit there and say, you son of a, I am gonna, I'm the, you can say it. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the fucking, they hunter. all know me. <laughs> I'm the hunter, man. Today I'm the hunter. And when Randa, Randa McMillan just asked a question and Randa, I just want to point out. So I think just Patrick just answered your question because she said, this is what I struggle with the most. As soon as I wake up, I'm thinking about if I'm going to be anxious, how do I stop this? I try so hard. And Patrick just answered that. Mm -hmm. So don't be passive. Wait, oh, is it here? How bad is it going to get? Get up in the morning. And the first thing you should do is say, hey, anxiety, where are you? Mm -hmm. Right. You are coming with me. We are going to do this and that, and you have to come. Right. Oh, I'm, what if I feel scared? Then let's feel fucking scared. Yes. Let's go feel scared, right? We, our problem is we're scared of scared. You know, we think scared is dangerous and fear helps to fight danger. But when you start treating fear as danger, that's where the loop picks up. So go be scared, not go be fearless. Go just feel whatever the hell you're going to feel today. You don't know what you're going to feel in five minutes, but you know what you feel now. So that hunter mindset, you're not going to go find things that aren't, don't exist, but you're going to switch your attitude towards from like victim, right? The hunt did, right? Like Patrick, like you described perfectly, like looking over your shoulder. Oh, is it there? Is it there? And this way, the success of your trip is based on how I feel. Okay, Patrick, you're in the hotel. Okay, relax. Do a meditation. Listen to Barry. Okay, I did it. Oh, I feel good. Oh, success. Not really. That was comfort. That's great. That's nice to feel comfortable. Success is 
I feel scared. I feel happy. I feel whatever. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I feel. I could feel more of those things too. And then the success is I went to the fucking, ho the freaking hotel. I went to the hotel. Check. I did what I need to check. I noticed how I felt and my, my, you know, my success is on my action. So my actions need to go towards things that I can control, not try and fight away things that are only to be noticed. And that's why I really wanted you to come on. So you can like speak from somebody who's been from the beginning till the end and you still stick around, you pop on, you help people, you come on the dare calls, you come on to dare advance. I know you're do a lot of peer things. So really want to introduce you to everybody here. And um, I hope you guys found this helpful. Um, this way, it's not just coming from us all the time. It's coming from people who've been through DARE and saying the same thing, but with slightly different twist. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it, Michelle, yeah, very much. Also, I'll hang on to see how the meeting goes. Okay, That's sure. All. Cool. So, all right. So guys, any questions for Patrick or any, anybody want to ask, maybe we'll give him like a question and then we'll move on to the groups or anybody find that helpful or similar like um, stories of where maybe some of you might've first started. You can pop that in. I see like Q and A is in a different spot than these chats. Okay. You gotta, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. So as they come in, well, um, we'll pop in. So, so I wanted to, so based on this little bear thing. Okay. Do you guys understand this, right? Actual tree falling on your head, stop life, deal with it. But we constantly are in this like purgatory of what if there's a bear memories of a bear thoughts of a bear. Okay. Feelings of a bear sensations of a bear. Okay. This is what we're targeting when we are talking about dare, not your thoughts. I'm not here to get rid of your thoughts. I'm not here to make your body feel better. All that stuff might happen by accident, but that's not dare, okay? So I'm gonna read all these questions that kind of hook up to this. And I thought it would be fun for all my chat people, there's 40 of you, um, as I read the questions and Aida and I and Patrick, you're welcome to jump in too. But as we go through an answer, I want I made this little, little character because I know you guys love my fancy drawings. So we fight thoughts, physical sensations, and feeling. So I put like rainbow here because it's like all different colors of things. Okay. So I think as I read these questions, let's put a check on every pot, every time somebody's talking about thoughts, sensations, feelings, and anytime some sort of like doing comes up, because these are the questions we get probably 80% of our questions is going to be like what you hear coming in. Okay. These things are to be passively noticed, gentle acceptance. Oh, I notice I feel blank right now. So the questions that come in, like all of my chat people, sometimes it's easier when it's not your question, right? It's easier to hear it from other people. That's why we like groups. So I'm going to read them and somebody go ding, you guys too, because it'll probably be easier. The chat's kind of like on a delay. I'm going to put check marks and then we're going to see how common this is. Everybody's trying to do something about these things. And it's all this active involvement. Guys, let me know if I missed something. Fight, why? Trying to calm down, trying to feel better, comparing, Patrick, you already got there, internally engaged, reassurance, is this normal, anyone ever, pushing, push through, fight through, got to push through this, um, control, change, judge, should, beat yourself up, frustration, yeah, but, attach it to forever. Did I miss anything before we get going? I think you covered everything. <laughs> okay, so here's the questions. I called it the fight of all the wrong things because what you guys are actually sending in the questions are, are not actually the problem. It's the fact that you're treating them as problems. Okay, so here we go. I wake up in the middle of the night with a racing heart, right? Racing heart, check, um, from panic attacks. How can I stay asleep, right? You're trying to control something and reduce my anxiety at night, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first, I'm gonna go through the questions and I hope you guys can see it, they're all, they're going to be sound totally different, but they're all very similar. So how do I, like, I wake up in the middle of the night, right? 
with the racing heart, how can I make myself stay asleep and reduce my anxiety? So you see, fight. So here's another one. How do you deal with anxiety that comes from physical pain, such as chronic migraines, muscle stiffness, body aches, okay? I'm, I, um, the migraines, in addition to constant physical pain, cause my anxiety. My anxiety makes the pain worse. Any advice? Okay. So um, here's another one. So we experience fatigue because we can't sleep. We can't eat because of stomach issues. We shake internally due to constant adrenaline flow. Um, we have fear. We have fear, thoughts. <laughs> I can't keep up, right? We have fear, thoughts going through our heads. We have body aches, headaches, and weakness because we can't eat or sleep. There's a lot going on. Sometimes it is difficult to accept and allow all of those sensations. See, this is always the theme of all these questions and hard to engage when you are constantly exhausted, especially when this goes on all day long. Okay, here's the next one. How can I get rid of morning anxiety? Okay, is it possible to have bodily sensations 24 seven due to anxiety, like manually breathing and pressure on the head? I am having two symptoms that are really challenging to accept. I won't read the whole thing with them, but one is vertigo um, and the other is lack of appetite. I am on a daily loop and struggle with that, okay? More or less forcing myself to eat. I am not quite sure how to handle that, okay? Um, I've recently become terrified of having a heart attack induced by an anxiety attack. My heart is healthy and my doctors tell me it is impossible as this is a fear I have to carry around with me. What can I do to get over it? Okay, is it possible? And if anybody had written in any of those questions, jump on and say, oh, that's me, that's me. So we can chat with you too. Okay, um, what is this weird feeling I have in my head? It's almost as if my mind isn't clear as it used to be or something kind of like floating or disconnected. I am unsure how to explain it, but I can tell I don't feel like I used to. And how can I help this feeling subside? Okay, so I don't even know if I really, do you guys on the chat, do you see a common theme with all of this? I wanna see any yeses or any noes or do they all seem like, yes, okay, oh, good. Thank you, Caroline. Yes, okay. Same thing, low mood. I have a very low mood when my mood is really low. I find the positive attitude I need to be hard. I end up tearful. Do you have any advice for dealing with anxiety and depression at once? Um, tips on intrusive thoughts. Um, somebody who's getting premature gray hairs. Seeing these hairs bothers me because I interpret it as aging myself prematurely and hurting my body through anxiety. Um, and here's the kicker. Okay. And then on here, somebody actually submitted the answer. So I just wanted to read all this and then I'm going to just shut up. The final one I put in at the end, I'm struggling to find the difference between pushing through and pushing away the thin line between white knuckling and getting through to the other side of anxiety. And I know I get people that are working so hard and that's where the frustration comes in. Cause am I pushing through or am I pushing away? Right. Pushing. And so somebody submitted this as a question, but honestly, this is the answer to all the questions. So Juliet, if you're on the call, if you want to pop in, you're, you're a rock star girl. Okay. In the dare Facebook group, people use dare as a verb, as if meaning to barrel through any uncomfortable or challenging experiences. I remember Barry had a daily dare addressing the difference between white knuckling through something and using the dare approach. I think you talked about that in one of your webinars as well. I read a few days ago, the section of the book about healing with the heart and the section about supercharging recovery. If you look at the core qualities of the dare response, you'll find things like acceptance, allowance, compassion, playfulness, and kindness. These are the real qualities that heal anxiety, and they are in fact qualities of the heart. In the end, you heal your anxiety with your heart, not your head. It's the light and warmth of a compassionate heart that clears the dense fog of anxiety. Your mind can manage and control anxiety to some degree, but it doesn't have the transformational power to heal it. That power comes from the heart. When your anxious mind is taken out of the way, it's your heart that allows peace of mind to be restored. I feel like the heart of the dare process is really the heart and that it somehow doesn't get the attention that it could. Could you maybe talk more about the role of the heart in dare 
and how to connect it to get to a place of acceptance and allowance? And how does it relate to the run towards step? Wasn't that great? So Juliet, if you hear this, we're trying <laughs> because this kind of the message we're trying to send. We just happen to get people that get the most stuck are the ones that are doing the most and trying the hardest to get better. So I'm just going to be quiet. What do you guys think? I have feedback on all that? Did I lump all the questions, similar questions, the same sort of way? You guys. Oh, us? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I thought you mean. I thought you mean. <laughs> people in the chat <laughs> so sorry um come again michelle what did you say what oh, was about all that <laughs> <laughs> i'm so sorry i was looking at the chat to see what people <laughs> are writing i was doing the same thing <laughs> so it's like i put all those like i could keep going on this right and say like i feel i have a thought i have a question about this sensation a question about this thought how do i feel how do i fight through how do i push how do i dare through this and like Juliet sent in the perfect question, which actually ended up really being an answer. That's really what we try to address hours and hours a day. It's not get rid of, it's, it's teaching you people how to let go of gentle acceptance, passive allowance. Um, so yeah, I just wanted, I put all those questions together and then ended with what she submitted because it just all seemed to tie in together. So you guys wanted to add to all of that. So try and analyze your behavior. Just take a look at what you are not doing and what you are doing. So there is a trigger. A trigger can be a thought, a bodily sensation, a situation, a memory, whatever it is. And then just observe what you do next. There is the trigger and there is the fear. This fear creates a bodily reaction. And you will have matching thoughts, what if thoughts, intrusive thoughts. We cannot control any of that, but what we can control is how we behave then. The next step, what are you doing then? Are you going into Google? Mm -hmm. Are you going into Dear Advanced? Does anybody ever? Is this really a symptom of anxiety? And this question implies that you don't really believe that it's just anxiety, but it must be something much more serious. And that search for an answer, what it might be, this is what keeps you stuck. It keeps your focus on the anxiety and on the sensations, the endless question about why, 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 what is going on, what is going on. It's almost like your brain has no context. When you have a panic attack when facing a bear, you don't fear the fear because there is context. You can see the bear. Mm -hmm. And when the bear leaves, you're fine again. But with generalized anxiety, especially your brain has no context. You just feel all this fear all the time. And since you don't know why, you don't see an external thread somewhere, your mind turns inwards. And the context now becomes one of something is wrong with you. Right. And now go and find out what it is to save your life. Mm -hmm. This is the urge. This is what anxiety makes us believe. And if we follow that urge, then we go in circles because there will be another sensation and another one and another one and another why will come up and another why will come up and you will keep searching. And this is what, what is the fight. This is what, what draws you away from your life and from your values. So if you want to do something with anxiety, then do this. Focus on your values. Focus on your life. Do dare on the go, meaning you live your life. And when anxiety arises, I like that dare on the go. <laughs> you cool. work through it. When it comes, you don't sit at home and say, okay, now I'm going to wait till this passes. I'm going to put my life on hold. And when it's over, I'm going to go. No, first you go, you focus on your life. You do the things that you would do if anxiety would not be an issue for you. And you don't expect those things to be fun to be cool, to be enjoyable, it will not be. As Patrick says, look at it as practice. They will not feel good. But the pain of that discomfort will be less than the pain of staying stuck where you are. Not only are you missing out on everything in your life, but what I think is really the most painful thing is that you never get to experience what you're made of, what you have in you. 
And if you can't express in this life who you truly are, if you don't dare to find that out, you will always live and feel like a half human, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. like only experiencing half of your potential. And that is very, very painful. And time goes by. Time goes by faster than we all think. So dare to dare through that pain would always be less than the one staying at home, restricting your life, not experiencing who you truly are. Right. And dare through pain means just feel what you feel as you feel it while you do the things you can do. We cross up the list. We're doing all the things to try and control pain, discomfort, thoughts, sensations, feeling. That's how we get it mixed up. I'm going to go live life, not with a, a goal of a feel. And that pisses people off so much. We get so, who's so mad at me, right? Right now it's, well, what's the point of doing all those things? And that's why people do less. Well, I used to get so much joy and pleasure out of doing these things. Why bother? I feel nothing anymore. Or like, I feel awful. And even worse than feeling awful is feeling nothing. So I need to feel better before I get back out there. Could not be more opposite. Patrick said before, practice. The practice is just go live life. Somebody gave me a good word last week, discipline. I've been using the word firm. Just go out and do things for the sake of doing it. Firm with the idea that notice how I feel. It's time to go for a walk with all these feelings I found backstage, right? I'm made to live front stage. So I might poke my head in the back and find a whole shit show going on. That's for the backstage crew to handle, right? If otherwise I'm left with my head in the back, like performing in the front, but never really fully anywhere, you know? That so is so painful. That is so painful living your life like that. Always being in your head, locked up there, not engaging in anything, not with your family, your friends, yourself, your values, your hobbies. It's not fun. It's, it's very, very painful. Now pushing out is pushing out is painful too, but it gets you somewhere. It gets you somewhere. Right. What do you think, Patrick? Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I love the part about, you know, the heart and you know, one of my biggest um, lessons that I learned, there was an aha moment for me around uh, the gift that anxiety gave me is, is how brutally hard I am on myself whether it has to do with anxiety or other things. And so the lesson for me, if I was willing to be open to it was Patrick, you have this anxiety and panic disorder, but you also have this as, as a result of it, played a big role in it, have learned to be so cruel to yourself, your soul, your heart, who you are as a person. Um, and the anxiety and disorder, the anxiety disorder and panic does not define me. It, it did define me. It became so consumed with it. It became my identity and it's so, so not. And so what I did was I, I thanked, I know this sounds crazy, but I thanked the anxiety for saying, okay, how does Patrick learn to love himself? How does Patrick learn to love himself in a setback? How does Patrick learn to love himself when it's not going so well, but boy, you had this, enough courage to try. How does Patrick celebrate those things in feeling him and really feel them in his heart? Because what I've been revealed to my, what's been revealed to me is I've got this other problem of hating myself so much that if I don't do something about that, my, my practicing is going to be even that much harder mm -hmm. because I'm quick to cancel it out, to beat myself up, to do all of these things. How do I find progress in anything if I hate myself so much? Uh, and, and that's, you know, sometimes that's hard to hear, but I know in my own experience that I truly hated myself. I, I did. You know, you said a, a good word in the beginning when you were just first started saying, you said, I've learned how to be so cruel to myself. Yeah. And then you said, I hated myself. And it sounds similar, but it's like, be so cruel, like 
action versus feeling, right? And so again, I changed my actions and then I can start changing my feelings. And you said something so clearly in, in one of the groups months ago, I was talking about like being, being nice to yourself really and saying kind words and, oh, it's my anxiety, I, I'm so down on myself. And you said something like, that's not an anxiety problem, right? right? That's not an anxiety, just that's how, and how you talk to yourself problem. And that could be changed like immediately. Tell I don't wanna say it the wrong way. What did you say? It was like- you know, it, so it is, it, it, you know, it is that. And you know, what I know today is this, that I was, I mean, I was an unbelievably creative, special, innovative, just how I survived, how I survived for so long, I need to celebrate, embrace, and hug myself. And thank every person that's out there that's getting through the day right now and finding ways to do that. Instead of judging that as awful and terrible, what I've learned to know is wow, mm -hmm. wow, that's pretty friggin' demanding, and you're doing it, and you should be celebrating who you are and your courage, your strength. Your, your, your ability to want a better life. I mean, this wanting to, to improve, this wanting to do, those are just, those are the things that, that define you and make you so special. And instead of this victim and why me? And, and because that was me, victim, why me? I hate this. And when is this going to change? And I'm, I can't go anywhere. And I, and I would, I would judge myself all the time. And and, and so loving myself is embracing that part of who I was back then. Man, that was courageous. Man, that was, how did you figure out to get through that one, Patrick, with all this anxiety and you did it? Mm -hmm. Man, that's, that's awesome, Patrick. You're really, you know, just a special person. And so, you know, that's, that's so critical in all of this. And so when I go out today, like I'll give you an example. Like if I go somewhere, I mean, I'm freaking human. And this thought of like, you know, I'm going to Greece and, and so here's the difference. So this. Okay. Thought hold on. Cause this is perfect. I'm going to preface this with anticipatory anxiety questions since you're <laughs> going to Greece. Okay. I'm going to say the questions and then I'm, there's a good chance. What you're going to say is probably going to answer these. Yeah. I'm flying July 4th. Haven't flown in 10 years. I would love any tips for anticipatory anxiety during flight trips. The more, and here's another one, the more advanced notice I have about an anxiety producing event, the more anxious I become about it. I would love to be able to use this lead time in the opposite way to feel less anxious as the event approaches. Any tips? So anybody else want to pop in on the chat or the Q&A with their, like, like not just how, we're not just fighting how we feel, we fight how we think we're going to feel. So, um, I'm guessing that's what you were going to start talking about. So I wanted to throw those questions in there so that they got answered too. <laughs> Michelle, may I just point out one thing that stood out to me? Can you can you tell me what to do so do. I feel less anxious <laughs> before trips? You just gave yourself the the answer, right? Yeah. Because yep. you are by trying to feel less anxious, you are essentially saying I don't want to feel anxiety, and mm -hmm. that resistance and yeah. here we go again so instead of trying to feel less anxious don't care about feeling anxious make it your goal, goal to care less about the anxiety if you right. do that then you will feel better as a byproduct feeling better will be a consequence of caring less about the anxiety and not doing things and finding a sophisticated technique to alleviate right. your anxiety leading up to the trip and caring less comes as another byproduct of doing less right so it's like when i have that thought of what if i say well then i guess i'll feel anxious on the plane well, I can feel anxious right now. What level is it? Is it a two right now? Well, let's get it to a four because I can notice those things, can't control them, don't need to get rid of them, don't need to stare at them. I can feel them. Again, focus on where you're like, you can actually send energy to. You're sending energy to thoughts, feelings, sensations, you spin on the hamster wheel, right? So send it someplace that's constructive. It's not constructive. You don't go anywhere, but spin. At least this way you put your car into gear and you drive, right? Otherwise you're just revving the engine. 
not doing anything. That's exactly how it feels, Michelle. Vroom, 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 all the time, right? You know, like, why is it stopping and your foot is on the gas constantly? Mm -hmm. Why is it still there? The stages of progress and confidence, it's, it's really interesting because, so like, I'll give you a before and after. So like before, um, when I was going somewhere, and, and, and trust me, I needed this and I'm not judging this. And, and I just am aware of the stages of progress and confidence. So I'm going somewhere that's causing a lot of anticipatory, anticipatory anxiety. And again, please, I'm not judging this because I needed the same thing. I just want you to know the evolution of it. Do I have my dare book with me? Do I have Barry's applications that I can get access to? Do I, do I have this? Do I have that? And do I have this? All normal things. But my thought process was I need these things. So I hopefully prevent the feeling of having. Mm -hmm. Just in case. Just in case. I'm not judging that. And I needed that at that time. Okay. I, I, I just wasn't equipped and ready. And I needed everything that I could. And I'm not, and I'm glad that I did those things. But I'm going to Greece. And I will tell you, I'm human in respect to, do I ever have moments where old response might be my initial thought? Absolutely. So, but here's the difference. And this is where I know progress and confidence has been made. Because I couldn't go out of the, the country. With, there is no way in hell you were getting me out of the country. Absolutely. Remember. And so that thought, so here's, was, here's my next response to that flash response was, I really don't care if, if you're there or not. <laughs> you're coming, you're coming. If you're there, you're there. I don't really, it doesn't mean, I really don't care if I have anxiety anymore. I really don't care what my feelings are around being afraid of them. They're just feelings. They're just sensations and they're just thoughts. And that was it, it was gone. It wasn't this, I better have my dare book with me. I better, let me listen to four of Barry's apps so I don't have to feel this way right now. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, am I back to square one? I, I had a flashing thought. Am I, am I going back? Am I losing all the ground that I've gained? And no, I'm human. And so what, Patrick? Right. I don't really care if I have anxiety anymore. If it comes, great, bring it on. And it's gone. So I don't care about the feeling anymore. I don't care about the thought anymore. I don't care about the sensation anymore. I just don't care if anxiety comes anymore. If it comes, great. And by having that attitude, it doesn't come and stick around at all. It right. doesn't, it's not interested in me anymore. Right. It's Without not. an expectation of it not being there. Right. Because that's where everybody gets, oh, I'm saying I accept and allow, but it still came. I'm like, right. Ken, <laughs> you said it good. So it came. It's here. Now when, what? When, <laughs> now you you're truly, mad. <laughs> when you truly, and I'm going to use this word very strongly, when you truly don't give a shit, yeah. whether it's there or not, you've made it. Yes. Amen. You Absolutely. Have, you have found me. Really to have it. That's my favorite phrase, be willing to have it. And you can apply this to every situation. Be willing to have your shitty thoughts. Be willing to have interest, um, panic attacks on the flight. Be willing to have that. Willingness is key. Yes. Think about it this way. Everybody who steps into a car is 100% willing to have a car accident. We are taking that risk 100% and we're still doing it. Same with stepping into a plane. We are oh, yeah, let me add in driving, driving for you too. So you can answer these driving questions okay, as well. Right. You're talking about cars, same exact thing, right? I am willing to accept the idea that something might happen. So mm -hmm. I just want to say these questions so that they've been said, so we can see they're being answered. Even if I don't say them, they're probably being answered, right? How do I overcome thoughts of driving? Not necessarily accident, but that I feel trapped right? Mm -hmm. That comes up a lot with driving, like on a bridge or in the middle of nowhere when a stretch of road or no exits, no houses, no buildings along roads, just trees and open fields. Okay. I have panic attacks on busy main roads, bridges, which makes it impossible to use exposure therapy. Do you have any ideas or solutions? Yeah, I do. Um, 
I suddenly stopped driving last year after a bad panic attack. I'm slowly driving again around my neighborhood, but cannot seem to get past 10 minute drives and fast areas scare me. And I get bad at stoplights, even as a passenger. What tips do you have for me to get past this? I'm going back to work in three weeks and I need to be able to drive and feel free again. So <laughs> I wanted to throw those in as you were talking about driving and then just keep going. But this way, people who are, I'm, I'm hearing how this would be relevant to the driving questions. So forget about your goal of driving and feeling fine. Just forget it. Forget it. Scratch that. It's not going to happen. If you want to feel free and calm while you drive, you will have to drive and feel shitty and panicky and anxious. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you have to, if, if you want to get to this goal, you first have to drive here in order to get there. Your yeah. first goal is driving and feeling shitty and feeling panicky and experiencing that although you are having a panic attack and feel anxious and have these thoughts, nothing is happening. The worst case scenario is not coming true. You are not fainting in your car in the middle of a bridge, causing a, a massive accident with 20, 30 cars behind you, killing everybody around and you. And I die and you die. Now I'm at my own funeral and I can see me at my own funeral and it's so sad and I'm <laughs> crying and my family's crying, right? Who visualizes their own funeral because you felt like dizzy in the car for three seconds and now you've got it all, like, the flowers, the lilies, right? We have it all planned in like a second like that. Yes. So try <laughs> ponder this and, and be okay with that. Make the choice, make the conscious decision to be uncomfortable while you do these things, because if it wouldn't be uncomfortable, you wouldn't have an anxiety issue, right? right. There is no way around it. The amygdala only learns by action. It's a dumb organ. It's very, very dumb, very old, doesn't listen. You can have as much intellectual knowledge and wisdom and know dear by heart and how I have more of a problem if you're like that the brighter yes. you are the smarter yes. you are the more let me read it once again maybe it clicks then let me just read it again let's follow this instagram account oh let's read this success story so because there is this need of more that because there's just one puzzle missing so that i can get moving no you know everything you need to know you have everything in you do it you must do it without the doing nothing Will happen and I'm fired today girl <laughs> do it <laughs> no it's true I don't mean to make fun of it because I know how scary and uncomfortable this can feel but as Patrick said there is no other way around that right. and for, unfortunately on one hand but I actually don't like to say unfortunately because you grow so much from that experience, knowing what you're made of, how much strength you have, that transfers to other areas of your life. You don't only get confident driving on bridges, you get so much more confident in other areas of your life. Right. And then this confidence to let yourself feel fear, right? That yeah. fear is not danger. And somebody posted way back um, in, um, sorry. Oh, somebody came on that hasn't been on in a long time, just posted in the chat. Sorry, I just was looking at that. Um, like somebody was saying, well, how do, well, when it's just fear, it's like that's exactly our problem, right? Like Aida was saying, when there's context, right? Bear, fear, we're looking at the bear, not the fear. Body's cranking out fear, but the focus is on the bear. So I feel all this feeling, but I'm staring at the bear. When there's no bear, there's fear, but without context. So now it doesn't just feel scary. It feels danger. And we're like, oh, this feels danger. Where's the danger? So since there's no bear, we find the next best thing. So now we go, well, this sucks. Well, let's get rid of this. So instead of fighting the bear, again, your alarm knows fight. It knows how you treat situations. So your alarm knows when you do this, when you do this. So when we're doing this for a bear, it's great. Your fear will keep pumping. As long as the bear is still there, we will keep fighting. When the bear dies, we stop fighting. Our alarm knows when we stop fighting. That's where the whole, I feel like it's gonna last forever comes from because there's no bear to kill, right? So we trying to kill these things. I just gotta kill these thoughts, kill these sensations, kill this, right? Get rid of these things and that'll be my bear. And when I slay the bear, then I'll stop fighting. And that's where I think that forever comes in because it's a forever fight. Mm -hmm. The fight is what you're doing forever. But we think, oh, I keep feeling, I have to keep fighting. No, you keep fighting is the problem. So hoping this is going to click for a lot of people with this. Um, 
this call today. This is you no, know, Michelle, the more you practice, really, the more you practice, what I have found is there's this, and, and, where, and for however long that takes, there, there comes a time when you can begin to separate yourself and see what's happening and see what you're doing to yourself. Um, you, you begin to be able to be a little bit of an observer and you begin to maybe a little bit intellectually understand, I see what's happening here and I know it's not, it's not truly me, it's how I'm responding to all of this. And when you have, to me, that was only going to become possible with continued practice, pra I can't say it enough, practice, 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 practice. And you, and you, you begin to have some um, relief from the enmeshment of it, of, of the absorp absorption of it, how it brings you in. You, you can't think clearly when you're so in and absorbed by it and enmeshed in it. And the mm -hmm. only way to get some kind of separation, some, time, some kind of space, as long as you're working the tool, there comes a moment, I truly believe, where you do get that space and you begin to see things happening for, for the re real reasons why they're happening and that they're, they can be undone and that, mm -hmm. and that, and that you build off of that. Um, but the more I sit around afraid, the more I sit around not practicing, the more I re-engage in staying in my safe place because I'm having painful practice, it keeps me in that self-absorption. It keeps me in meshed in all of it. It keeps me, the question of, but I feel this intense all the time. How do you get out of that? Well, you don't, I don't feel, I mean, I could be wrong, but I know for me, I didn't get separation from it all or, or have the ability to look at it until a lot of practice took place. But once I got an inkling of that, the exponential growth of mm -hmm. what it really was and what was really going on took a whole different level of progress as I began to understand that and the confidence of it. See, my trip to Greece is not that I have this major anxiety disorder and problem that I have to manage while I go and be prepared for. I'm Patrick Tui. I have a, I have a uh, oversensitized nervous system. That's all that it is. I can have a tendency to overreact to feelings, thoughts, and sensations. It has nothing to do, the fight is the anxiety. That's all that that is. And when I let go of all of that and just allow myself to be this person who I am and not enmeshed in it, because I no longer, I forget how that feels to get enmeshed in it. I forget how it feels to be totally absorbed by it. I forget how it feels to constantly have my antenna up on everything I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. That can't take place to me until I get some separation from it. The only way I got separation from it was practice and practice and practice while I felt like shit. Yes, practice feeling shitty. But just feeling shitty. It's so backwards, but I hope everybody's getting that this. That moment happens. It occurs. And when you get there, it's such a beautiful, wonderful thing. And it's because this is when the illusion, right? The illusion lifts. That, yeah. that anxiety is this illness. Something is wrong with me. My brain is damaged. It's something that I'm not doing. It's something external and oppressing for something that will harm me and kill me and it's restricting me. I mean, when you realize, truly realize that moment, this is only my doing, 100% only my doing, it, this feels amazing. It feels so, so free when you but like patrick said you only get that by allowing it in allowing it in fully being 100 percent willing to experience it to have it and okay. still do what you plan to do because okay. then it clicks in the brain oh it didn't happen i didn't go crazy i didn't faint i didn't suffocate i didn't have a heart attack i didn't have a stroke none of these things happened and then you gain that confidence and that strength to start being the hunter mm -hmm. that is hard in the very beginning but trust the process even though 
I know it's hard to trust when you don't have any good experience. This is the hardest part. It's like falling, jumping off a cliff, not knowing if there's a safety net. That's the hardest thing. But here is where you have, to, you have to trust. You have to trust the thousands of people who have done that and who felt exactly the same way you are feeling now and who are good now. You have to okay. trust that. What's the alternative? You have nothing. I, I always, the always, alternative is living I, as if a tree's about to fall on you every day for the rest of your life just in case a tree falls on you. And that's I, I exhausting. Always, I, I always have to thank Michelle because the first four months... She constantly would tell me that you did not like you did not like me. <laughs> you, have, you have to go out and you have to tell us about it next week. And I would say, you can kiss my ass. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm putting my. You're telling me to go out and get more afraid and more. There's no way in hell I'm doing that. And to this day, I can't thank her enough for staying on me and pushing me. And because she knew that that's what needed to be done to get to the other side. And it's. It's not complicated. It's, and I, I don't want to sound insensitive because it really is. It's, it's, it's not, it's awful. It's awful. Yeah. And but that's what makes it so tricky because it's, so, I say a lot, it's simple, but it's not easy. Yeah. And that's a lot of times what makes it so hard. When you say do nothing, even do is like an action verb. I was like, oh, tell me how, to, how do I do nothing? I'm like, Let me get a pencil, some post-its. I'm going to practice doing nothing today. I'm going to keep track of how much I did nothing of today. I'm going to time how much nothing I did. That's a lot of something for nothing. And some people take it literally. Like I had stayed home and did absolutely Oh, you're frozen there, Michelle. Uh-oh. Did you oh, here you are. You're back. Oh, so it's, it's really do nothing about the things there's nothing to do about. Okay. Do lots of things about the things you can do stuff about. Go do life. Go you know, notice I these things. Notice your thoughts. Notice your feelings. You are not meant to get rid of them. They are not to be gotten rid of. If you are trying to get rid of these anxieties, energy that you're creating and the energy has no place to go. Send that energy towards things that you can send it somewhere. Go actively get involved in life while you bring the stuff you might not particularly like, but since you can't fight it away, like Ida was saying, it's the willingness because you're not creating discomfort or getting rid of it. You had no control over it anyway. You're going to feel it. So you can either hmm, just feel it, hate it, but just feel it or feel it and do this the whole time that it's there. And it's not going to change this at all. It's like looking in a fish tank and seeing some shitty, ugly fish in the back going, no, go in the back, go in the back, go in the back until it swims into the back. You didn't do anything about the damn fish, but you did a lot of this. And now you're associating fish bad, right? Like I was saying, it's a dumb part of the brain. Fish bad, bright fish, good, no bad fish, right? It's like fish alone. Leave the stuff you don't like alone. Pay attention to the stuff you, go, you do like and go do more of those things. This is the opposite. Anxiety dare is not about focus on what you need to get rid of. This stuff, focus on what you wanna grow more of. The goal is irrelevance and indifference. This is a fading process. The discomfort fades when the confidence grows. So all of this is how to grow your confidence and trust in yourself. And that will not come until you start allowing discomfort. And discomfort means allowing fear. Fear will always feel scary, but we don't need to be scared of scared. And we practice that by not fighting scared. I want to give you an example. Every year, every year it's the same. As soon as summer comes, the first week when it's really, really warm, like 30 degrees, and I sleep under the roof in my room, it gets so, so hot. The first week, it's awful for me. My blood pressure drops, and I always feel like on edge and kind of like with low blood sugar and kind of panicky, but I'm not anxious about it. So my body is doing something. My heart is beating faster and my amygdala is reacting to that. So, and one night last week, I woke up in the middle of the night, sweaty. My heart was racing. I had a full blown panic attack and experienced DP. I got up. I was like, oh, oh yeah, that's the heat. 
Mm -hmm. Had a glass of water, stood outside for a while, went back to bed and slept. And you know what? The next day I felt kind of on edge. My appetite was low. I had palpitations. What is that? Biological stress system. Yeah. Leftovers. But leftovers. <laughs> but you see, and this is where, where we want you to be. We want you to experience sensations raw as they are, but not add fear to them. And when you experience it like that, oh, that's a palpitation. Oh, here, that was a fleeting moment of DP. Oh, my, my pulse is racing, whatever it is. Uh -huh. And don't add fear to it. This is where you want to be. Then everything else fades away in time. And one, I would like to leave you with one little exercise. If you have fear of sensations, for example, a skipped heartbeat or a twitching, whatever it is, just notice, oh, here was the sensation and here was my fear. Try to separate those two. Because they come together, it's such an immediate process, uh, fast process, sensation, fear, reaction. Mm -hmm. And just try to separate those two and say, oh, that was a palpitation. And look, here was my fear. Just notice that and move on. And you will find that, oh my God, those are two different things. They're, they're separate. They don't belong together. And this right. is where you can then work and say, okay, I, that's just, just, I love that. Michelle always says that, just a palpitation just a sensation just a thought nothing more and if you add, if you take away the added stories and meanings and evaluations then this is really all you need to do do you guys get this do you see this anybody in the chat like it's not what happened what aida just described something that happened but the way we describe what happened is like that could have been described by anybody on those facebook pages Oh my gosh, guys, trigger warning, setback alert. And every year, what do I do? Every year this comes up and every year I get thrown into the setback and here I am, heart palpitations and, and now I'm on edge and I woke up the next morning and it's still there and I got my dare books back. And I got my audios back in. And what do I, look at all of the actions that were taken. But like your story is same facts, but different response to the facts. That's why it's called the DARE response, not the DARE elimination method. The setback is in how you treat the return of discomfort, not a return of discomfort, right? Anxiety is not the problem. The anxiety disorder is, the pro is how we, when we treat anxiety as a problem. It's weird, it doesn't become a problem until we try to get rid of it and we label it as the problem, which then- That's a disorder. Problem. Yeah, yeah, then this is where the disorder Problem. starts, right? Right. And our bodies do weird shit all the time. It's just when we're sensitized, our flashlight is on everything. We notice everything, every little heartbeat. We notice everything. What we, and, but we, we feel this all the time. Our bodies do that. They fluctuate. They do things. Trust your body and allow it to do weird things. And sometimes, like in my case, uncomfortable things. But my body had a reason it was the heat. Maybe I, I haven't hydrated enough that day. I don't know, but there was a reason for this and it was nothing dangerous. Try to see your sensations as that. Oh, my body is doing weird shit. All right, fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go with that. And before turning to reassurance or going to the ER, going to the doctor for another follow-up appointment, why not say to yourself, well, I'm going to observe the sensation for seven more days if it gets worse i can still go right let's see let's, let's see. see let's see yeah. if my body does this again again it's it's subtle but it puts space oh let's let's see what if my body does this again i'm going to be more like the observer i'm going to notice if i have that weird little twitch again oh yeah i did huh. okay so in seven days when i call my doctor i'll let them know oh yeah i noticed a lot of them were in the mornings okay like with that sense rather than, oh my God, what's this? Oh my God, oh my God, I gotta do something right now, right? It's, it's, if there was no fear, like you said a, a great a line before, it's like, when you kind of take fear out of the equation. A lot of times that helps differentiate danger. And that was some of the questions that came in, like, how do I know if it's real danger or not? And usually that's always tied up with health anxiety, right? Like, how do I know if I'm really dying or not? Like, well, there's a lot of time you can identify danger without fear. Like you can see a, a car accident outside and know it's a situation that needs to be attended to without the fear. 
fear just helps you attend to danger. Problem is we start feeling fear, fear magnifies sensations and we kind of create danger out of those sensations, right? Ooh, everybody who has a heart attack gets heart palpitations. I'm noticing heart palpitations. <gasps> what if this is a heart attack? Like we play it in the opposite direction rather than I'm having a heart attack right now and let's deal with it now. It's I'm having discomfort right now and it reminds me of something that could happen. So guys, pay attention to feels like, feels like it's gonna, what if it does, even if it's two seconds into the future, right? It's not here. What's here is discomfort attached to some idea of future danger. You know, Michelle, one, one of my most significant confidence builders was, and I've shared this story, but for those that haven't heard it before, but was one during a very severe setback for me. And, and it really was an awful experience. And, you know, I was traveling and I know you've heard this, this story, Michelle, but, um, I was at a hotel down, down in the Southern part of the country. Um, and I had level eight anxiety the whole way there. I had been in DARE for probably about three to four years, um, three years maybe. Um, and it was, it was a major setback. I had all night long, major severe panic attacks, high level anxiety, I couldn't eat. Um, I just wanted to go home. I remember looking online if there were late plane flights, I was going to cancel my meeting for the next day. Um, I will tell you this, that at that point in my uh, journey, I did have the ability to have some compassion about what I was experiencing. Um, and so as a result of it, although I didn't uh, feel all that great, <clears throat> I didn't <clears throat> necessarily beat myself up all that much either. I had a meeting the next day and I sat in this boardroom with a client of mine. It was a two hour meeting. I may have heard two minutes of it. Um, I was so self-absorbed. It's amazing the talent that we have to keep, think that we have engaged conversation with somebody and they really think you're listening to them. And you have these <laughs> moments of being able to, to plug in words here and there and they think that you're hearing everything. Meanwhile, if you knew what I was experiencing right now that I had mm -hmm. a level of anxiety, and I'm just trying to find a way out the door to the toilet in case I throw up, you would uh, say you're crazy, Patrick. You got it all together. You look like you're doing wonderful and, and all of these things. It's just really amazing. So that's a talent, by the way, and that's something you should celebrate. <laughs> um, and I left that room as quickly as I could. I got to the airport as quickly as I could, and I came home. And... Um, I knew I was going to have to go back there within four days for another meeting. This is my, one of my most significant confident points, confidence points. The old me, had I not had the practice and been where I was at, would have canceled that, four, that meeting that was going to happen in four days. I would have beat myself up obsessively about how I failed um, and how awful I felt and that I'm not getting this and what's wrong with me and I'll never get better. I know that setback feeling. I had those. I know early on what setbacks can do to you, the collateral damage that Michelle always referenced. I was that person. I would be, I would be held up for days and weeks and not want to practice anymore because I wasn't getting it. I wasn't going to be moving on. What's wrong with me? I know that internal dialogue and I know that language. But at that stage of my recovery, I had the ability to have some compassion and say, Patrick, as awful as that was, I know that you're getting better. And, and I know I'm, I'm just amazed that you were able to do it. And you're going back. And you're going back, you son of a bitch. And you're going to tell this anxiety to go kiss your ass. That's what you're going to do. Okay. And you're gonna even go a step further. You're gonna you're gonna get the same hotel room mm -hmm. where you had panic attacks all night long, and you're gonna confront that anxiety, and you're gonna look it square in the eyes, and you're gonna say, "I'm okay. Bring it on. I am not gonna run from you anymore. I am not gonna be afraid of you anymore, and I'm gonna feel everything I need to feel. You are not gonna control my life anymore. You're just not. 
while you live stream it on Facebook to the dare groups. I did that part. I did. <laughs> I did. But you know what happened? You know what reward I received on the way home was this message that I got that I'm not afraid of this anymore. Ah, oh, wow. And that's it, right? That's it. All the work leads up to this moment. And if, had I not done it in my most painful moment, I would have lost that opportunity. So when you're feeling like you can't go anymore, when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling it's just too much, that's the time you get out and you go practice and you tell this son of a thing that I'm the hunter and I'm going to feel what I need to feel and I'm going to experience what I need to experience, but I am not going to let you have me sit on my couch all day long and say, I can't do this anymore, or I'm never going to get it, or why is this happening to me? That's when you need to get out and do it. Right. Because once you confront that with the tools, not white knuckling it, there's a big difference. I wasn't white knuckling it. I was allowing the feeling. I was allowing the sensation. I was allowing the intensity of it. I was allowing myself to feel uncomfortable. And it, it was this moment as I'm going back to the airport and getting on the plane saying, I'm not afraid of you anymore. You yeah. Don't scare me. And if you want to be here, great. Right. And not, not afraid anymore. Not afraid of being afraid that, anymore. That, exactly. You know, and that's, I, I want you guys to just, I know we got to wrap up, but like, stop trying to eliminate fear. You, you can't because you kind of want to feel afraid when there's a murderer chasing you down the street. Like get rid of elimination, get rid of feel better, right? Allow yourself to feel afraid. That's it without the fight. The whole point of running towards is to say, I show I am safe by my actions while I feel fear. And it's the behavior of act Here's as if thing, not Michelle. danger. Here's the thing. If everything was fine and that felt great. And I did be no practice. Yeah. I wouldn't have gained it anywhere near what I gained in that painful moment that I needed to experience to truly look it in the eye. I, if I, I'm, I'm grateful I didn't have a nice experience with no anxiety that I could call you the following Wednesday and say, M Michelle, I must be moving a thousand steps forward. Cured. I, down there and I had no anxiety <laughs> and I can't wait. I must be cured. I mean, I, it works. I, I got it, Michelle. Thank <laughs> goodness. No. No, Patrick, you got it because you were in the depth of its pain. Yeah. And you looked it square in the eyes, not in fighting it, not in white knuckling it, in truly allowing and accepting and, 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 and uh, 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 sitting in the discomfort of it. Right. Anxiety right. lost its power. And that's, so when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling enmeshed in it all, when you feel like I can't do it because I'm so, that's when you should do it. That's when you need to say, you know what? I love what it is saying about your values and who you want to be and what your potential is. And these are the things you need to attach yourself to when you're sitting in that muck and, and that anxiety is wanting you to stay stuck and say, hold it. You know what? Maybe this is my moment. This is really when I can confront this in a way mm -hmm. that helps me. And that might get me to the other side. Not until I wait till I feel good Five days exactly. of feeling good. Now I'm ready to go to Greece. Now I'm ready. Oh shit! Oh my god! I've got major panic. I wasn't ready. Get back. I wasn't ready. Get back again. I wasn't ready. I wasn't Next ready. Year. I better go back home again. It doesn't <laughs> work like that. So it gets back to my initial message. You got to practice, and 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 you got to work those tools while you're practicing. And separation occurs. Observing occurs. Confidence occurs a I don't care anymore occurs. And when you don't care anymore, that's when you get freedom. Right, right. And just to leave off on one line, yeah, you, you, everybody's like, I just want to get there. I want to get there where I don't care. Somebody's going to write that guarantee. They're probably already typing it and now deleting it. They're like, oh shit, Michelle said what I was going to say. <laughs> I want to not care. You accidentally not care when you let yourself care without fighting that you care. Okay, does that make sense? Like then you stop caring about something when you stop trying to stop caring about something. That's weirdly how it works. I wish it worked different. It would be much easier, but because it doesn't, it's learning how to not fight that you care. It's okay that you care. 
it's the fight of caring that's kind of keeping you stuck. So, um, so Patrick, I'm glad you stuck around for the call. I hope you guys found it helpful to bring on some other people. If you guys like this, we'll add in more people each month. Um, you guys have any suggestions if you'd like to pop on, um, Hey, we're open. We're all these programs happen because of feedback from all the members. So we'll just keep adding and doing things as more suggestions keep coming in. All right. And I think we basically answered pretty much every a couple like little miscellaneous things, but I think they were really like all addressed. So, oh, say that again about the not caring. Oh, guys, I'm not good at saying things twice. Um, the caring less comes. You, if you're trying so hard to not get right, like you stop caring so much. What did I say? When you, when you let yourself care without fighting the fact that you care. Say, yeah, I, I care that I'm scared. Yeah, I hate being scared, but I'm not going to fight being scared. I do care, but I'm not going to fight that I care. And it's this that what keeps it here. The fight is what keeps it here. When you let go of the fight, you allow this to fade. Okay, that's how things start to fade away. So I don't know if I said that right the second time, but Cynthia, luckily this is being recorded. It will be emailed to you guys. Um, so just fast forward up to this point And I think I said it better the first time. <laughs> Patrick, thank you so much for attending the call. It was thank fun. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for having me, everybody. Yeah. Guys, be like Patrick. And you can find more of Patrick in Dear Advanced, right, Patrick? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, you want to say a word or two about Dear Advanced? Oh, yeah. Come join us in Dear Advanced. It's our nice little family, Patrick and like 200 something other people. <laughs> um, yeah, if you guys like this, I know I, we try and say this for people that come on that might be new. Um, we have other support systems out there. We have a boot camp coming up for people that still don't quite get the concepts of DARE and want like a nice solid foundation. It's, it's 10 days and you'll get like, you know, messages and audios from Barry every day and every evening. Um, it comes with three group calls over the course of 10 days. Um, so that's boot camp. Um, and then for people that really kind of get the concepts that maybe have had one to one calls with one of us or have had um, a boot camp or challenge week or get it, um, Dare Advance is really to help you with the implementation of it, right? So once everybody gets it in their head, it's more of like a support system to say, okay, back into life help each other practice, right? And help each other fine tune areas where we might get stuck. So yes. if you guys, I mean, if you're already paying for the app, I mean, I'm not selling anything here, but really it's $10 a month for the app. It's $25 a month for Dare Advance. And it includes the app and it includes three group phone calls a month. Um, now we offer five to choose from. Um, I run Zoom two calls. of those. Zoom calls. Five. Zoom, group Zoom calls a month. Um, Barry runs one of them. Aida runs two. I run two. Um, and members of DARE um, Advance, you're welcome to join um, three of those. Um, they're all recorded just for DARE Advance members. There's a private little Facebook group. It's crazy. People have flown around the world to meet each other. Patrick can attest to that, right? Members who weren't leaving their homes are now doing marathons with each other in different countries. It's wild. And it's it's just nice. Such a lovely group. It's so, so nice. lovely. So wonderful. You know, it's so helpful to be in a group of people, to not feel so isolated and lonely. It is <clears throat> so relieving to talk with somebody where you don't need to, to use much words because that other person exactly understands what you're going through. This is yeah. so, so helpful. And all of them are so supportive and kind and lovely. So yeah, uh, yeah try it out. Would so love if to you'd like to sign up for Dare Advance, go on the website, dareresponse.com um, under um, coach programs. Um, and um, their, the website's <laughs> being changed. So Dare Response, you'll find it. Look for Dare Advance. Oh, yeah. So just make sure message support. Um, so that you can sign up for Dare Advance and you can cancel the, the premium app. Um, you shouldn't be paying for two things at the same time. Dare Advance includes all of that stuff. It includes the app. So for like 15 more dollars a month, you get three hours of group coaching with like us. So, and it's fun and it's nice. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's it. And if anybody wants to book one-to-one -one calls, we offer one-to-one -one calls. Um, we just have a lot of 
We got a lot of things out there. Nobody needs to do any of no. these things. This is the crux of dare. All the information is out there. Check out the YouTube videos. We're like, not hiding anything. To the channel. We're not hiding <laughs> anything. <laughs> We're not going to give you the real answer if you give us a certain amount yeah. of money. It's just more no. support for people that might like just a little more help along the way, a little more motivation. Um, so, uh, so guys, see you next month. Maybe we'll have a new panelist come on and um, keep posting on the dare pages and we'll see you all soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Dare Podcast. The Dare app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at dareresponse.com.